From Interior Alaska's most trusted news source, this is the Fairbanks Evening News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Our top story tonight, Alaska State Troopers have confirmed female human remains were found yesterday afternoon near North Pole. That's right, the remains were discovered shortly before 3 p.m. Little detail was made available, but the body is being sent to the state medical examiner's office for identification. Witnesses reported that the remains were found by a man chopping wood on Freeman Road. The man reportedly found a trail of blood on the dead-end street in the neighborhood. The woman's body was found, as well as a nearby duffel bag with items inside. Troopers have begun a questioning process in order to identify the woman. Trooper spokeswoman Beth Ibsen said an investigation is ongoing. Alaska State Troopers are investigating a three-vehicle crash on the Seward Highway north of Girdwood that left a 33-year-old Fairbanks man dead. Jonathan Borland was pronounced dead at the scene of the crash late Friday morning near 96, mile 96 of the highway. Troopers say 59-year-old Kim Sterling of Sterling was traveling north when he lost control of his pickup truck and collided with a sedan driven by Borland. According to Troopers, Sterling's truck then struck a truck driven by 30-year-old Jason Gerke of Kenai. Troopers say Gerke, Sterling, and two passengers sustained non-life-threatening injuries and were all taken to hospitals. At about 10.20 this morning, state troopers responded to a report of a wreck at University Avenue and the Mitchell Expressway. Investigators say 53-year-old Darlene Nikolai of Tanana was driving a pickup that ran the, a red light at the intersection. It collided with another pickup driven by 27-year-old William Redfern of Fairbanks. Both drivers were taken to Fairbanks Memorial Hospital for treatment of what were believed to be non-life-threatening injuries. The investigation of the crash is continuing. Another car accident backed up traffic this afternoon on Noble Street. Fairbanks police say a motorist ran his vehicle into a downtown apartment building. The unidentified driver apparently suffered an unknown medical issue while driving his pickup truck down Noble. Police say he crashed head-on into the apartment building, which, according to witnesses, is where he lives. Firm, but uh, possibly that the driver was diabetic, may have lost consciousness uh, prior to colliding with the building. Um, the driver was transported by medics for medical issues which don't appear to be related to the accident or any injuries sustained um, from the actual collision itself. Uh, building sustained minor damage, um, nothing major, nothing structural where there's any serious issues, but it appears that it was pretty minor. The court-martial of a Fort Wainwright soldier accused of murdering his three-year-old son began today in Washington State. Nathaniel Olrone is facing charges that include premeditated murder, aggravated assault, and rape. Meanwhile, family members and friends of the child victim, Aiden Olrone, says the murder is something they never saw coming. The Criminal Investigation Division has released little information about the murder, including how the child was killed. Friends of Aiden's mother, Nikki Medford, says the boy and his mother were close and the family showed no signs of domestic abuse. There really wasn't. To me, everything was just, they seemed normal to me like any other married couple, but I never saw this coming at all. Um, it was pretty devastating. I started busting out crying because I just couldn't. I've never known anyone, not that, that happened to anyone that I knew, so it was shocking. Nikki Medford has started a social media page called Aiden's Cry. She says she wants to help other victims of domestic abuse to reach out for help before a tragedy like her family experienced happens to them. A link to the page can be found on our website. That's webcenter11.com. All right, when we come back, a look at Alaska's two main U.S. Senate candidates. And supporters of the Fairbanks Four rally to support the men incarcerated before a hearing in the case. Those stories are next. Stay with us. Welcome back. With the midterm election less than 24 hours away, Alaska's two main U.S. Senate candidates are taking separate paths down the home stretch. On Saturday, Senator Ted Cruz from Texas joined Interior Republicans in support of Dan Sullivan's bid to the U.S. Senate. About 350 people packed a cleared showroom floor at Jean's Chrysler. Senator Cruz spoke for about 20 minutes before introducing Sullivan to the mostly partisan crowd. During his delivery, Cruz called Alaska ground zero in the race for GOP control of the Senate. Republicans need to take six seats to gain control of the chamber. In an exclusive interview, Cruz expanded on what he meant by ground zero. And the country is facing an historic choice. Do we continue down the path we're on, the, the failed Obama economy, the assault from Washington, our constitutional rights, or do we change course? Just huge support from a whole host of different 
uh, senators in the U.S. Senate coming up to Alaska because they know exactly how important this race is. This race is going to decide the control of the United States Senate. Sullivan campaigned in Anchorage today with former presidential candidate Mitt Romney. Senator Mark Begich is taking a different approach leading up to Tuesday's midterm. The incumbent is not relying on big guns, but choosing a more grassroots approach leading up to tomorrow's election. He spent this morning on the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus touring construction progress of the new engineering building. He spoke with several workers on the job site. Senator Begich then took to the heart of campus, passing out hot chocolate to potential voters. Begich says his campaign has been about reaching Alaskans from all walks of life. I'm a grassroots campaigner, always have been. I think that's a big contrast to uh, my opponent who does different type of campaigning, hard to find him many times, and uh, I just get out with the people. But I do think it's going to be a very close race, but it's going to be about uh, folks coming out. And I can see when I'm I go out right here, you saw young people very impressed that I was out here, but also this is not my first trip here. Supporters of the group of men known as the Fairbanks Four began picketing this afternoon, just days before a hearing is scheduled in the case. On November 10th, a Superior Court judge is scheduled to decide whether or not to unseal documents that the Alaska Innocence Project has been seeking to have released. Supporters say the content of these documents can help to collaborate what they call a confession made by convicted murderer William Holmes. The confession was brought to the Fairbanks Police Department's attention by a California Department of Corrections officer in 2011. Those holding the signs say it's important to show support for the men they consider to have been wrongly convicted behind bars for 17 years. Hopefully the confessions that, you know, the state's hiding um, in this case, that the public needs to be aware of that because with all of the evidence added up, it points to the Fairbanks Four's innocence. I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm hoping that they really see the truth in this and the judge does the right, makes the right decision. I'm, we're going to be all there supporting this. During the month of November, the U.S. Army honors wounded, ill, and injured soldiers and their families by commemorating Warrior Care Month. This year's theme is Show of Strength. Warriors in Transition Commander and Fort Wainwright commu commu community members rather, participate in such things as wheelchair basketball and sitting volleyball. Unit leaders, Warriors in Transition, and Medical Department Activity Alaska leadership at Fort Wainwright will be speaking on their experiences with the Warrior Transition Unit throughout the month. All right, well, we have the weekend recap coming up next, and we have hockey and swimming championships to talk about. Plus the new I-5. Stay tuned with Joe after the break. Hello, Interior Alaska. Joe Cook back in the sports seat for you this Monday evening with your weekend recap. Much like a season ago, the Ice Dogs have established themselves as the team to beat in the NAHL after making Halloween night one to remember in a 4-3 shootout win over the Minnesota Wilderness. The Ice Dogs went for the sweep on Saturday night. It was tied 1-1 going into the third period, but Hans Gorowski lit the lamp twice in the third period. He converted a power play goal at the 426 mark, and a little less than five minutes later, he called his own number for an un assistant goal his fourth of the year to get Fairbanks a 3-1 lead. Chase Monroe, he made 19 saves, including a shutout second period for the Banks. Lonnie Clary would add an empty net goal as the Ice Dogs would go on to win this one 4-2 over the Wilderness, increasing their winning streak to seven games. It's the longest winning streak of the season so far in the NAHL. We started off pretty strong, had a little lull towards the end of the first period. Um, in the second and third, I thought we were, we were better, um, so it created some opportunities for us, us being closer to pucks and having uh, quicker options when we had the puck on our stick. And the Ice Dogs will be back in the dip this weekend, hosting the Kenai River Brown Bears in the Raven Alaska Cup Series. That series is tied 1-1. And the 16th ranked Alaska Nanak hockey team didn't fare too well this weekend. In their first WCHA series of the year, the Nanaks were not able to secure any points despite going into overtime with the, with the Bemidji State Beavers on Saturday. Bemidji led 1-0 after 1, but five goals were scored in the second period with Marcus Bassar, Garrett Perry, and Nolan Heisman tallies for Alaska. After a scoreless third, it was 3-3 at the end of regulation, but Corey Ward provided the game winner for Bemidji just two minutes into OT as the Beavers won 4-3 on Saturday. They also won 6-1 on Friday over the Nooks. UEF started the year with a 5-0 record, but they have dropped their 
third straight game. They'll be back in the friendly confines of the Carlson Center this weekend, looking to stop their recent skid against the Bowling Green Falcons. It'll be the first WCHA home games of the year for the Nanooks. The dynasty continues for the West Valley Wolfpack swimming program. Saturday night at the Hammy Pool, the Wolfpack swept the Boys and Girls Region 6 swimming championships for the seventh straight year. The West Valley boys totaled 115 points, the girls 125. North Pole Patriots were the runners up, getting 76 points from the boys team and 71 from the girls squad. West Valley swept the 200 medley relays and their stars were stars. Tristan O'Donohue won the 100 backstroke and Tommy O'Donohue won the 100 breaststroke. His specialty, Angie Randall won the 200 and 100 freestyles. Latham's Alex Suleimani won the boys 500 freestyle in four minutes, 59.30 seconds, which is fifth best in the state based on the last rankings. He came in ranked 15th. Cassidy Heaton took the gold in the girls 500 free. The North Pole boys won a memorable 400 yard freestyle relay by seven one hundredths of a second in the final event of the night. But how does West Valley feel about continuing to win year after year? It's no magic elixir. There's no, you know, I'm not giving out strength pills. They just work really hard and we've put together enough swims together over the years to have really good chemistry and then the freshmen come in, they know they have to fill roles and they do that and then it just it builds year to year and year and we just had a great and unbelievable time. Our relays, we always try to break like our times like every meet but yeah we have I think we broke all our goals this week and we're going to try to break better goals at state. <laughs> and after a full weekend of local sports, here's this week's I-5 interior top five plays. At number five, Monroe's Dylan Steele finds Matthias Sumagala on the doorstep for the goal against Delta Junction and Saturday's high school hockey jamboree. At number four, Hans Gorowski's two-goal outing against the Wilderness in game two on Saturday. The Ice Dogs win their seventh straight game in a 4-2 win. At number three, the West Valley Wolfpack boys and girls team win their seventh straight Region 6 swimming championship on Saturday night. At number two, Ethan Samosa's game-winning shootout goal for the Fairbanks Ice Dogs on Halloween night. The Ice Dogs win 4-3 over the Wilderness, winning the shootout out 3-2. At number one, more from the pool. Check out the finish in the boys' 400-yard freestyle relay. North Pole's Joshua Handelin out-touches West Valley's David Shin as the Patriots win the relay by seven one-hundredths of a second on Saturday night. To select the play of the week, go to the KTVF Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter pages, comment on the post, or email Joe Cook at KTVF11.com for your pick. The play of the week will be revealed this Friday. The I-5 Sports Report is brought to you by Adiant Orthopedic Physical Therapy. And that does it for sports tonight. Thanks for rocking with me for a little while. Mike Schultz is next with your full weather forecast, and we'll catch you next time. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to our Monday Night Weather. Mike Schultz with you once again. Hope you had a good weekend. The weather was beautiful. Lots of sunshine, clear skies, and cool temperatures. But all in all, not too bad. And especially for Halloween night, it was pretty good, too. Here's our weather photograph for tonight. This was sent in by Nancy and Mark Hummel yesterday. If you did not see it, there was a magnificent sunset. They were able to capture it for us. And you can see, the, once again, the beautiful reds and pinks. And uh, again, as always, if you have a photograph, please send it to photos at ktvf11.com. We'll share it with the rest of the audience. Our numbers look like this. The high today, 23. Right now, 19 degrees. Low last night, 10 degrees. Record high, 43 in 1928. Record low, 31 below in 1907. Sunrise and sunset. Not quite seven and a half hours of daylight, and that's a loss of six minutes from yesterday. Our satellite and radar shows a little bit of activity moving across the southern sections of Alaska, a little more intense across southeast Alaska, bringing rain there. But again, the Alaska range is blocking all the moisture from coming into the Fairbanks area, so we're not looking for anything at all to be happening for the rest of the week. A very uneventful weather pattern. What's going on across the rest of the state? Well, it is raining around Juneau, also around Ketchikan, and some showers at Kodiak Island and Cold Bay. Anchorage checking in with 32 degrees. Not too bad at Nome, partly cloudy 25 there. Cloudy skies at Barrow in 13, and for Yukon clear in 3 degrees. Lower 48 weather. Looking over the Pacific Northwest, the rains have returned to the Seattle area, 57 degrees there. Some rain falling around the Dallas and Fort Worth areas. And the rest of the, uh, the western half of the country looking pretty good for the most part. Lots of sunshine. And it's all not too bad over the eastern half either. As you can see just a, a few scattered showers around the Miami area. Otherwise, partly cloudy to cloudy skies up and down the eastern seaboard. And the overall satellite radar, again, showing a little bit of energy moving away across the central sections. That's what's bringing the rain to the Texas area. But nothing real organized or strong, especially uh, over the Pacific Northwest. Looking at a few showers there. 
but all in all, a pretty good weather pattern. And the overall picture for Election Day is calling for a little bit of rain across uh, parts of Texas and Oklahoma. Otherwise, the East Coast looking pretty good and the Western sections looking pretty good, too. Well, back to our outlook for the later on this week of the jet stream taking a big dive way down to the south over the eastern half of the country. That means colder air and a lot of opportunities for more rain over the uh, northeast sections. While out to the west, things look really good there. Uh, very pleasant and very warm temperatures to continue. Back to Alaska for tomorrow. Here's what it looks like in the northern sections. Cloudy skies expected to barrel, mostly sunny skies at Nome, and partly cloudy for Fort Yukon. Here in the interior, another great day. Just partly cloudy skies for Fairbanks, Healy, and Delta Junction. Temperatures in the low teens, though, so pretty chilly. Tomorrow's uh, forecast for southeast Alaska, scattered showers today with its significant winds increasing over the uh, region, mainly because of that area of low pressure sitting across the uh, southeastern sections. Juneau about 47 degrees, or actually say Ketchikan 47 degrees, Juneau 43. Over to the southwest, a mixed bag of weather once again. Partly cloudy skies for Bethel, rain and snow showers at Cold Bay, and also some rain and snow shower activity at Kodiak. And if you head on down to the Anchorage area, not all that bad. Partly cloudy skies uh, covering the Anchorage, Homer, and Valdez areas. And temperatures low to mid-30s, so all in all pretty good. Okay, once again, time for our kids' weather, and we're back with the kids. This week we're visiting with the uh, children from the Denali Elementary School region. And as far as our... Our visitor tonight, here's a young lady to talk about a, a very strong windstorm that made her family uh, very uncomfortable during a hiking uh, journey. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to think. <laughs> Emily and I went on a camping trip. When we left, it was sunny, but for some reason, when we were putting up the tent, a storm happened. But we put our tent up in time, but forgot to stake the pegs into the ground. All of a sudden, it got windy and rainy, and our tent blew off the ground. And thank you, Kira, and thanks to Mount McKinley Bank for sponsoring our kids' weather each night. Tomorrow night, another young lady will be here to uh, share a picture with us. All right, here's your forecast for the remainder of the night. Looking at overnight lows right around 1 degree with clear skies continuing. Tomorrow's forecast for Election Day, a few clouds, otherwise very little change. 12 degrees, no reason to prohibit you from getting out and voting. And your extended forecast, absolutely no change going on. Maybe a little warmer temperatures by Sunday. And overnight lows will also be cooling down three to about 10 degrees below on Wednesday night, but three degrees below zero Thursday, and then warming up to around zero for Friday and Saturday. And like I said, maybe some clouds in on Sunday. So all in all, not that bad. In fact, pretty good for this time of year. It could be a lot colder. Wow, hmm. okay, well, so. Well, I had heard a report earlier today that uh, by tomorrow, after, um, tomorrow overnight was going to be 15 below. So I'm glad you're here to set the record straight. 15 below. Doesn't look that cold. Yeah. No. Okay, very good. It 10 below, be 15 below. The low-lying areas, yeah. Badger Road, Goldstream Valley, the coldest area, we're going to settle down there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it could be that cold, but still, that's, that's nothing right. for us. But it's time <laughs> to get our cars uh, ready to plug in. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, anything colder than cars. 20 degrees above zero is recommended to plug exactly. in. Exactly. At least, uh, how many hours is it? Two hours before you travel? Yeah, right. two, two. Two to five. Roughly, yeah, I've got a timer, so I never worry about it, but uh, it was. I've got a garage, <laughs> so. And I've got an auto start. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Everyone yeah, Beckley goes out and starts it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's very true. It only works from about 10 feet, though. So it's oh, really? really? Yeah, What's that's the use that's of right. an auto start? <laughs> but Halloween, we got to get back to that. Everybody oh. did fantastic. Your yeah. costumes were great. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it oh, was yeah. perfect weather afterwards, <laughs> taking the kids trick-or-treating. That was, uh, you, yeah. It was very nice. Yeah, and I didn't think, you know, 20 above was, or it was about 15. It, was, it wasn't too bad. I mean, mm -hmm. last year we definitely got spoiled, but this year it wasn't too bad, so. Right, right. Who's got a candy hangover? Oh, I have got a lot of, I don't <laughs> have a candy hangover. I have a lot left, left over. over. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. We had the best no candy. candy. Who, who handed out the best candy? I, I did because I was handing out full-size Twizzlers. I was getting the candy. Snickers and Three Musketeers. Oh, yeah? That's what we handed out. That's it? Yeah. No I had my children go trick or treating. Uh -huh. So I have a plethora. Of of <laughs> bring it on <laughs> in. Bring it on in Trust as our me. weight gets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very good. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for mm -hmm. that weather report. That's great. And uh, I think we're finished here. So that will wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. We are glad you could join us. Tonight on NBC Nightly News, the investigation into the Virgin Galactic crash is focusing on several clues. That's up next with Brian Williams. Of course, you can join us here six days a week at 6 and 11 or online anytime at webcenter11.com.
And from all of us here at the News Center, have a good night. See you at 11. Good night.